And welcome in to The Meltdown. On today's show, as expected, A24's latest movie, Civil War, became the studio's most successful single weekend ever. But how well will the film hold? Succession continues to rack up tons of awards, even after we all went through the Roy drama that was. Fallout's first weekend on Amazon Prime led to a lot of time indoors as some of us binge like vault dwellers over the past weekend leading us to a Luntz's list that profiles the best video game adaptations of all time from software to screen it's all happening right now as you enter the world of the meltdown presented by my bookie broadcasting live from the culver studio two big balls in a tiny studio teaching you and me about everything they know to me sound a meltdown this show possible thanks to all of you our lovely meltdonians joining us as we are on the road to 2,000 subscribers hoping to get there sometime in the summer season if you have not already we would love for you to subscribe and be a part of this journey with us as we continue to build each and every day the other half of the meltdown that is my cohort mr john lunsford john you hosted an event yesterday it happens at the end of each and every primetime poker club regular season and it was known as Poker Mania. I know, Rockstar, you've got questions about Poker Mania. We'll get to those. <laughs> Didn't yes, get an invite. Yesterday, John, we both experienced highs and we both experienced lows. <clears throat> I am the absolute best at one thing. And that is gaining a commanding lead in literally anything and then losing whatever that thing is. That's not a quality I think I want. Um, it is the quality I have, though. It's the gift I have been cursed with. Um, I absolutely destroyed every single person at that table for an hour or so. And yes. then he had towers of chips, towers. Of I mean, chips. I, and then I mean, from the top rope at poker mania, Tim jumped on you. No, it wasn't him, <laughs> but a lot of people jumped Two times. I hit Lunsford for big chip stacks, but um, he won't remember that because it would be giving me credit. But anyway, because I finished ahead of him, um, you guys, but you know, uh, I probably at one point had more chips than the whole rest of the table combined, but I lost it all because that's what I do. I get greedy, and I chase everything, and I lose it all. So it was fun. I finished the first spot out that didn't make any money. Neither one of us made any money. We are all poor today for having played poker yesterday. Have you ever heard the Ricky Bobby quote, if you're not first, you're last? Have you ever heard about that? That's the way that. I play poker. John, he settles for <laughs> fifth and sixth and counts that as some sort of championship run, and it is not, sir. But we had – I promised we weren't going to make today's show contentious following no. Civil War, but no. here we are. We had the hand of the century happen yesterday, and this is one that did not involve you. It did not involve me, but we witnessed it. And I want to just replay the hand really quickly because it is that dramatic. We're talking about a Poker Mania championship on the line. One person is holding Jack-7. The other person is holding Jack-8. The flop comes out, Jack-7-deuce. Nope. And guess what? The person with Jack-7 goes all in. The person with Jack-8 goes, oh, I love Jack-8. This is one of his favorite hands. Yep. And he decided... You know what? Jack 8 never fails me. I am going to call. I call. So he's betting all his chips. The other guy's betting his chips. We got a trophy on the line. We got a championship on the line. It's incredible. Next card comes out. It's an ace. Doesn't change anything. No. The guy with Jack 7 is thinking, all I got to do is dodge an 8. Well, guess what happens on the river? An ace. Another ace comes out on the river, which means the Jack 8 guy wins because he had aces and jacks with an 8 kicker, where the other guy had aces and jacks with a 7 kicker. And it was a brutal way to lose runner, runner, ace, ace. And the only thing that would have hurt this guy is an ace or an eight on the river. Now, recount that story back to me, Rockstar. Well, no, please don't. The river <laughs> is wide and yeah. deep, but you got to do it on the turn or you're going to flop. If you flop on the jack eight, jack seven is going to win, but jack eight won because he was pocket aces. Two aces <laughs> on the top. And then sure, jack yeah. seven was like, dang, I, but the guy loves jack eight because that's my favorite hand. And he held on to it because it was his favorite hand. And he won mm-hmm. the thing. Well, there's a couple of versions of that story. Rockstar has one of them. I have the actual one. But, John, it was a very dramatic finish to the Poker Mania event. It was. I had to relinquish my uh, defending Poker Mania crown. But uh, congrats to Blake, who ended up winning it and walking away with a trophy. Enthusiasm. Walking away with my Blake. trophy because Amazon sent me the wrong trophy. You know, Amazon's pretty good for a lot of things, including Fallout. But they're not always 100% perfect in shipping, so I got the wrong trophy. So thanks, Amazon. Hopefully the new one will get here today. 
We can move on to stuff Amazon actually does right. We're going to talk about what stuff Amazon does right here in just a few moments. While John and I couldn't find a way to win, we did find a way to wellness, John. Mm. And that is something we're both very proud of, Leslie and her board certified team. Yes, go visit Way to Wellness. You can see right here, Tim and I weighing in uh, with our friends at Way to Wellness. Go to planforme.com. You can learn more about everything Leslie and her whole board certified team can do for you and the plan that they can set for you as you see some of her team right there, Leslie in the back as well, Tim uh, posing for the camera, <laughs> having to make everything. Uh, was I posing? You were like, oh, yes, thank you for the camera. Anyway, oh, yeah, go to Way to Wellness, learn everything there. They have me on a plan. They have Tim on a plan, as you can see right here. Um, they have Jim Dunaway on a plan. They have my dad on a plan. It's a whole family affair there. So go to aplanforme.com and visit our friends at Way to Wellness. Love Way to Wellness for sure. We have some of your Comments coming in, including Nick, who says, I always feel like I'm about to start watching Stranger Things with the music that has been selected there. And also saying, it's poker games completely opposite from yours. Get a lead and then get too conservative, where you get a lead and you get too aggressive. And then we have Napster Haven that says, so Fallout was amazing. This is where we need to go next. And that is to the lovable boy, Tyler, known as our producer. If someone has never played Fallout before, Tyler but they wanted to jump into the game series after what they've seen off of Amazon. What game should they start with, in your opinion? So my favorite is Fallout 4. It's the most recent. Well, not the most recent. You got Fallout 76, but that's a, a buggy mess. That's a conversation for another time. Uh, Fallout 4 is just the most complete Fallout game I've ever played, uh, in my opinion. It's one of the more recent ones, so you get better graphics. You get... New weapons. And it won like, like a ton of Game of the Year awards and all of that. Oh, yeah. This was one of the most anticipated games of the year it came out. And to let everybody know, I'm not a huge gamer. I've never been the marathon gamer where I'll play six, seven hours on end. I usually uh, top out at about two and a half hours. Uh, day Fallout 4 came out, I played for nine or ten hours straight. So, Jeez. Wow. high recommendation from me. Well, it takes you about eight hours or so to get through the entirety of the series on Amazon. I know that three of us have watched it in its entirety. We will have a spoiler review coming up here on the channel of Fallout Season 1. John, without getting into any spoilers, because people are at all different sort of chapters right now with this series, those that are watching it maybe haven't even completed it. Overall, your sentiments ending the series would be what? Um... It didn't quite fill the Westworld size hole I have in my heart from Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy and uh, Warner Brothers ripping my heart out with that. But um, it was very well done. They obviously know what they're doing. Um, the name Nolan means something, obviously. And, you know, I thought it was a very well done show. Um, it was faithful to the game, whether you play the game or not. But coming from the video game side of things, where I have only actually played Fallout 3, it's not – the game itself is not really my kind of game overall, but – the setting of it I love, um, kind of that retro-futuristic style. And as long as you're faithful to the game, a lot of times you can produce a good product because games win awards like crazy because they're good with a good story, good gameplay, all that kind of stuff. So if you're faithful to the game, you're typically going to produce a pretty good show as well, um, which I think they did. I love the casting of this show. Walton Goggins is awesome in Fallout. I, I don't know how else to put it. He's perfect for this role of the ghoul, and he plays two sides of the same coin so well because he has to masterfully play what it was like before the bombs dropped and after the bombs dropped. And Tyler, I thought that that was actually the highlight of the show and the thing that I think unanimously everyone can agree on because there are some people who are defending the source material so rapidly right now that they don't feel like they got every single detail right, including towards the end of the series, which we won't get into why just yet. But there is some debate about whether or not this is actually over with those that are big fans of the Fallout game series. I think Walton Goggins definitely is. Uh, Walton Goggins was one of the standouts for me. Um, also, every time he gets a close-up in a fight scene, they do almost the Dune music, but it's yodels. Did you guys notice that? No? No. I mean, yeah, right. now that I think back to it, I, I wasn't thinking of Dune. Dune wasn't on top of my Well, maybe it's because you of, haven't seen it five times. <laughs> that's true. Maybe you have a little bit of an addiction there for sure. We have Rockstar back with us. <laughs> you do love so watching stuff about bombs dropping, though. That is true. Yeah. I do. Uh, Oppenheimer, my favorite movie of 2023. Although I would argue you know, with 
how you much you love the Dark Knight Rises that you're in the same category there of bombs being dropped and bombs being utilized. Yeah, but that was over the ocean. So. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, that is that is fair. We have Rockstar here with us. Rockstar, hey. on Friday's Luntz's List, Good. we discussed the best road trip movies, but then you actually went on a little road trip yourself. Uh, we did Black Jacket Symphony, went to Orlando. We had to pile in. Five of us had to pile in a little car and drive to Atlanta to meet the bus, get on the bus, finish. They were doing Prince's Purple Rain at the Atlanta Symphony Hall. Got the last two songs of that. Uh, got on the bus. I was super excited. I got in my bunk. Everybody else wants to like do some stuff and party a little bit and hang out. And I went directly to my bunk, watched the first episode of Fallout. Oh, uh, fell out of sleep. <laughs> uh, and I, no, it, it wasn't bad. It's just like it's just you're trying to trigger. I was talking to somebody. Um, Jesse was on the bus with us, and she plays the game. And I was like, you know, you're seeing all these characters that I hadn't played that game in forever. But I remember the ghoul, and I remember the cowboy. But I just, but I just remember is the ghoul. Bad or good, I can't remember. And then I was like, do they have death claws in this? Because I remember how scared to death I was of death claws. And we were talking about that for a minute, and then I passed out. Uh, but the trip was good. Played a show, a corporate show for Alpha Insurance. And um, one of the buses had a little bit of an issue on the way back. Got home around 10 a.m. yesterday. Do you think that there is a false sense of what life is like as a touring musician oh, yeah. from yeah. the people that attend these shows. Like, can you give us a little behind the scenes on maybe well, what perception is compared to reality? I can give you a nutshell. So my wife, we had this opportunity to do this tour last year with the Fleetwood Mac. We were gone. We we're going to do 20, 26 shows in 28 days or something like that. So it was, and it was every night was on the bus and you have your bunk. And so my wife was a little hesitant because you think of the party life. And I was like, you got to understand this is, if you followed me, I will give you an example. Let's say we're playing tonight in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The bus arrives in Tulsa around 9 a.m. You sleep till 10. Um, you have an agenda to load in at 11. The, the, the uh, doors are open at the venue, so you have access to bathrooms and try to get Wi-Fi or whatever. Find your dressing room, put your stuff down, set up camp, do a sound check. You load in everything. They have to get all the lights and everything, all the audio. Then we do a sound check for about an hour. So let's, Then you get lunch. Lunch before sound check. Do sound check. Then you have about an hour and a half, two hours to kill. Some people go take showers. Some people go eat dinner. Uh, we'll find a place to go eat dinner. You do the show at 8 o'clock. After the show, you take pictures with people. And then you get your stuff back, your gear back, put it back on the bus. Get your bedroom, clean up all your dressing room stuff. If there is a bar within walking distance, some people will go to the bar. for like. But you have a bus call at midnight. Hey, midnight, we're gone. We're going to the next city. Midnight, everybody's on the bus. You wake up. 9 or 10 o'clock the next morning, you're in Phoenix, Arizona. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Do you have any problems sleeping on a moving vehicle like that? You get used to it. I, at first, it's awful because it, there's no windows. To, so your your perception is if you're on the interstate and we're driving to New Mexico and it was snow. So all I know is there's ice on the road and you're driving at 4 a.m. and you don't have a window and your perception lying down in a little coffin is there's a huge turn. Like, oh, my God, we're tipping over. We're tipping over. And then it's like, no, no, we were not even – not even close, but it's like your perception is this is it. We're going down. You just have to adjust to that, and a lot wow. of uh, that sounds awful. <laughs> you do <laughs> well. Awful. It is literally a little coffin, but it's super comfortable. But you have this little curtain. You close. You got your own little air conditioner. You got your two charging. You got a wall outlet um, for your iPad and everything, and your phone. So it's you get used to that. Is your life? That is your bedroom. But would you're so exhausted at the end of the night that you're going to love sleeping in that bed. Would I be able to fit in one of those beds? You would. It'd be tight though. I think because our bus driver Tony is six. Five six six, and he he fits in one of the bunks. Okay, that makes me. Tony's a, a big guy. Better. Wow, that is quite a description there, John. Not the life that I necessarily want to live, but I respect <laughs> those that can do it consistently. I know our favorite band of all time, The Midnight. Uh, they had a tour where they had buses break down and backup buses mm -hmm. break down, yeah. and they had to do everything in a Sprinter van, and it was very difficult for them to make that work. But they got through the tour, and it built a lot of character, and it's probably why. Tim no longer wants to tour with the Midnight. Mm, yeah. Um, no, everything <laughs> everything Rocky has said over time from touring, especially the big tour he did last year, uh, I'm good. I mean, <laughs> what do I get to see? like San Antonio. Like when we have downtime, like I literally walk, I walked to the Alamo. I got to see uh, Dealey Plaza in Dallas. Like it's just cool things where like you have, you look at your phone like, okay, we're six blocks from Dealey Plaza. Y'all want to go? And like two of us will go and take pictures and stuff. Is that, that kind of stuff is really cool. But, you know, I was on the show and I was in Oklahoma or something like that. And Lance is saying that you need to go, where they filmed Tulsa King. It's like, no, it's not. I can't. 
go somewhere. Like it has to be within walking distance of the venue because you can't just get in a car and disappear unless there's a day off. And the day I had off in New Mexico, I saw a uh, knock at the cabin. Mm, not everybody the best else, way to everybody else went off. to a karaoke bar and I was like, I am not going to a karaoke. I'm going to go solo to a movie. Well, I'm glad that you maybe enjoyed the experience. The movie somewhat forgettable, but it's all right. still overall. Okay. Yeah. It was a solid base hit. We have some information here that has broke over the past hour of the armorer from the set of rust. Hannah Gutierrez Reed, we talked about this last week. Her sentencing date was today, and she was sentenced to the maximum penalty of 18 months in prison in a Santa Fe, New Mexico court today for the killing of cinematographer Helena Hutchins after being found guilty of involuntary manslaughter last month. John, I have no problem with the maximum penalty in this case. Uh, Knowing the details I know about this, her recklessness led directly to the death of Hutchins. We'll see if any other future convictions happen but this is one where her negligence did claim the life of a professional a mother a wife and someone that should never have been struck down on the set of rust if things had been handled correctly by gutierrez reed honestly surprised 18 months is the maximum for this because it directly led to the death of somebody else but uh have no problem with this as well and uh yeah don't imagine she'll get a lot of work once she gets out of uh, prison The judge had some tough things to say, including, quote, your attorney had to tell the court you were remorseful, talking about the lack Mm. of remorse Mm. from Gutierrez Reed, and also said, quote, you were the armorer who who stood uh, between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. For you, she would be alive. Basically, if if you'd done your job correctly, you would not even be standing here right now, and Helena Hutchins would still be very much being able to participate in the thing in which she loved, which was crafting movies from a cinematographer standpoint. And from everything we've heard, she was a rising star in that field and had nothing but acclaim behind her name. But what other things will come out from the set and the production that went wrong? I'm not sure. But one thing that makes no sense to me, Rockstar, is releasing this movie. So they are releasing it. That's been the plan, to release this movie, finish production release this movie that has been the wish of Helena Hutchins family. And I just don't know what the appetite will be to watch this. I would understand more if they were to take some of the footage and make a documentary about how, how horrible this thing went compared to actually releasing it in a fictionalized form where I don't think there's going to be that much demand to watch it. Maybe some morbid curiosity. It's going to be morbid. I think it'll do it. The thing is, I didn't think it was finished. I thought they shut down everything after that scene, and did they? They come? came back to finish it. Wow! So it is. It everything's. It's edited and ready to go. I don't know if all of post is done. Yeah. but I believe all of the principal filming is done on this. All the principal photography. And I don't understand like how Alec Baldwin can do press without something like this coming up. Like, hey, you can't ask about this. I'm just here to promote the movie. Like, just all that stuff because they got to do press for. Because I'm sure they saw the budget. Like, look, this uh, this is much money has been spent on this thing. We've got to release it. They can't do all, what's it called, Batgirl, uh, which is what, $100 million? Close to it, yeah. So, yeah, yeah like I don't think, it's been so talked about, and there will be a morbid curiosity, which, which is what I thought with The Crow. I thought The Crow, I'm not a Crow fan, but when I found out that I was a Brandon Lee fan after Rapid Fire, stuff like that, scene, like I want to see the scene where he died. Uh, people had that morbid curiosity. I want to see what it looked like when he actually got shot. And uh, it's sad, but true. Yeah, charges were dropped against Alec Baldwin because they had charged him with involuntary manslaughter in April of 2023, and then they filmed. They started filming then and finished in like a month after that. So, The plan is to release the film in some capacity. I don't know how, but we'll see how the marketing effort for that goes. But a, a real would, tragedy there on a Hollywood movie set. I want to guess streaming somehow. It has to be streaming. I don't think they're going to do a theater thing. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. But who, who, who takes that? Who takes that on? going with it? Something you can't really promote. And also, the shooting itself wasn't even captured on film because they were doing a run through of what it would look like. And so, you know, once word gets out that this isn't something that's going to, yeah. you know, feature anything that would sort of tick that box. And I, if that did happen, do you, as a director, do you keep that in there? Well, like, you know, it's. No, it's, I don't, no, I don't think you can. Yeah. I don't I'm just curious, like, what yeah. people would do. No. Don't think you should, don't think you can. Let's talk a little bit about the number one movie at the box office. According to the team at Variety, A24 and director Alex Garland's latest film, Civil War, made $25.7 million in its weekend debut. We were pretty split on how that film played with us. I gave it a 2 out of 5. I believe Rocky and Tyler gave it a 3 out of 5. 
and I believe, John, you were at a four and a half out of five. Correct. Over the course of the weekend, have you thought any further about Civil War and whether or not it still sort of holds that mark for you after having seen it late last week? Uh, yes, it absolutely holds that mark. I've gotten higher on it um, over the weekend, um, reading more about it. I'm tempted to go see it again this week oh, in theaters wow. um, with no poker tonight. <laughs> I thought about it tonight, but my wife is actually watching the first Omen right now at theaters, so she probably oh, won't want to go back. Good for her. I um, love that movie. She knows I don't want, didn't want to see it, so she'd hey, hey, I'm not going to watch Melda. I'll go watch the first Omen instead. Um, but we, we don't recommend that. Obviously, no, that's a bad, that's a that's a bad Omen. Yeah. <laughs> um, John, you could have left that part out. <laughs> she she went with a friend. This is the only time she could go. Oh. But um, no, I, I'm I'm higher on it now. I mean, I'm still not going to give it a perfect score or anything. And I imagine a rewatch still won't give me that. But uh, no, I still highly recommend it. And if anything, for the uh, incredible cinematography. Editing, sound, all that stuff. Yeah, ask you a question. If I take out one scene from that entire movie, do you think your your score would go down? If I take out the Jesse Plemons scene from the entire movie, because uh, it really doesn't change the course of anything. I know mine would. <laughs> would that's, it go, that's so crazy. That one scene pretty much makes the movie. I agree with you on that, Rockstar. Would it go down? Maybe. But I would still be overall positive on the yeah. movie. I mean, that one scene... That one scene wasn't, like, my only talking point. Like, for most people, that's, like, the one positive. And I assume that's why it gets any stars from any of yep. y'all. But that, that you know, wasn't enough to say, no, I like oh, the movie. well, it went from a four and a half to a one at that point because of that one scene. The Jesse Plemons scene is by far the most important in the movie, in my opinion, the most effective in the movie, but is not the only reason it gets the stars it gets from me because I think the production quality on it is really good. I just think it's a hollow experience. If you see our spoiler review uh, you'll understand a little bit more of our vantage points on that, but I I would have loved to have loved this movie, but I needed more. I did. It's the first A24 movie to lead the charts in North America, setting an opening weekend record for the New York-based specialty studio. It also marks the biggest R-rated opening of the year. Heading into the weekend, Civil War was projected to kick off with anywhere from $15 million to $24 million. Ended up making 25.7, so... The marketing has to get a lot of credit here. A24 is really good at marketing the, their films for the most part. They did a wonderful job in spending, I believe it was estimated, that they spent $20 million on marketing this film. 20 plus million, according to Deadline. As you had 400 IMAX auditoriums ringing up 4.2 million of the weekend, or 16.5% of the overall opening. Is this something, John? You saw it in Prime. Is this something you'd like to see on IMAX? Do you think it would enhance? If I go the see it again, it'll be on IMAX because okay. I, I thought about it Saturday, um, but I was in the process of catching up on all the things we needed to do, including watching Fallout. Um, that I decided not to Saturday, but I will go see it in IMAX again, strictly from the IMAX versus Prime. I think there's a, an understandable debate on both sides why people like either one. IMAX is a bigger screen. I think the sound is just as good. But Prime here at least has the more comfortable seats. It's in a dining theater, all that kind of stuff that overall is probably the better experience. But yes, absolutely. I'll go see this in IMAX if I see it again. According to the studio, Civil War overperformed in some markets like Los Angeles and El Paso, Texas, located in states involving the so-called secessionist Western forces within the movie. I think that Texas and California, you're going to see that markets really flock out to see this. There's been a lot of success in sort of the Midwest and even in the South with watching this film. And post-track data shows that there was a lot of walk-up business with 64% of Civil War's moviegoers buying tickets same day compared to buying them in advance. Of those buying tickets, 27% identified as frequent moviegoers buying tickets on opening weekend. 46% of those said they attended due to the subject matter whereas 39% cited the genre, 31% says it looks fun and entertaining. Only 17% said they bought the tickets for the cost of the cast. I don't think any of us would have said, oh, yeah. this is a fun movie. Yeah. It was marketed as being sort of a Independence Day-style film, sort of a DC on fire day after to well, tomorrow. Where's my David? Got to find my David. Where's my David? I Welcome to Earth. Welcome to the Civil Western War. forces. Yeah. Right. Will Smith was showing us who he was all along, except instead of an alien, it was actually just. You must see Will Smith at Coachella this weekend. Anybody? I, Anybody? I, I heard about it. I heard he performed it. Men in Black. He did. Uh, he was, was dressed up. There's aliens behind him. You remember uh, Left Shark from the Katy Perry yeah. Super Bowl? Mm -hmm. yeah. There were a bunch of people dressed up like aliens behind it. A couple of that were kind of like. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is the dance move. Well, aliens don't really like bad. choreography. Anyway, it's obvious. What yeah. were they doing, John? Show me one more time. That's how they're doing. So just kind of doing this, but like imagine like. It's Coachella. Like you're on stage sure. with Will Smith, and it's supposed to be this whole production. It's like a big spaceship. They were not really good. Did he slap it. one of them? Uh, no, not that okay. I saw. Rockstar, if you had to guess, what percentage of the audience that went to go see this movie opening weekend was reported as being male? I would go 62%. Close. 73% wow. were males that went to go see this movie. 57% of the audience was between 18 and 34. So this is skewing male, and it's skewing younger. The largest demo was 25 to 34 at 36%. Obviously, Kirsten Dunst is in this. Wagner Mora, Kaylee Spaney. And we mentioned Jesse Plemons steals the show. Can we agree, John, that you would have liked to at least seen more of Nick Offerman, that that would have improved the overall experience? <laughs> Keep trying. Uh-oh. No, I just like how you, that's the one argument I made after the cameras went off was, was that I would have loved to have seen the beginning speech. There's a, the very beginning, and I don't feel like it doesn't spoil anything because you kind of know where it's going, but there's one speech at the beginning that you see him practice and you don't see him actually preach. Then it would have been cool to just see, see the, kind of the full scene play out that they didn't do. I just want to let everybody know I didn't do that as some sort of dirty tactic to try to expose your off-air comments or anything. I did that as a way to unify us both, yeah. knowing that that is something that is a criticism we both have. That's all. It's like you took half a star off. Tell me everything. Okay, you're convinced I'm trying to draw blood, and all I'm trying to do is draw a handshake across the aisle. That's it. If we would just talk and listen to each other more in this country, we wouldn't have any sort of problems. If communication improved, we would be better off as a society, and I'm trying to do that right here one step at a time with each daily episode of The Meltdown. Well, Nick, we just wanted you to have more to offer, man. (laughs) That's that's a perfect way to end that discussion. Overall, the box office is roughly 16% behind the same point in 2023. It's down 31% from pre-pandemic times. So the theater's still looking to rebound here. Obviously, a year ago, we were all talking about what movie? The Mario movie. And we'll see if that ends up making Luntz's list of best we'll video if, game screen adaptations. We'll Hi, if, I'm Mario. Hey. We'll see if Nick Offerman makes Luntz's list. Oh. Number two this weekend was Warner Brothers and Legendary Entertainment's Monster Tent Pole, Godzilla x Kong, The New Empire. It dropped to second place after two weekends in the top slot. The film added $15.4 million in its third outing, bringing its domestic tally to $157.9 million. Is anybody still talking about Godzilla x Kong? Is that something that's resonating with anybody in this room right now? Of No? Any desire to see that one, Rocky? I have absolutely, positively, no, that's... So stupid. It looks like a Nintendo game. That's, that was, that's the point. It's yeah. Godzilla versus Kong in, in an old NES game style. That's new, so, right? When did you get that? Uh, a couple days after we saw the movie. I drew it. Uh, First time I've noticed it. I have no interest. I saw Skull Island on uh, TBS with John C. Riley. What? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the last time I think I saw the one with uh, Eleven, whatever it went with Brian Cranston, where he was in it for, what, three minutes? And I was like, I'm done with the Godzilla stuff. Eleven and Brian Cranston were two different ones. Oh, hey. technically she was in two of them, but two different ones than the one Brian. Cranston, I, just, I so. can't do it anymore. Yeah. Tyler, I would have liked to have seen a little less explanation on Godzilla X Kong and a little bit more explanation in Civil War. Uh, for sure. Um, Godzilla X Kong didn't need it though. I I just had I just had fun with it. Let's just agree on that. The Godzilla X Kong needed no people in it. We just needed the monsters and their emotions. I would have been fine with that. Which, yeah. The people only brought that movie down. That's why I was down on that one, and then you're down on Civil War for not explaining enough. So, you know, it goes both ways. Check out our reviews of both. I brought this to the table to give John what he thinks is a win, but it's actually no, not. I'm saying we agree that, yes, God no, but You said he's, he's satisfied with placing fifth, didn't you? That's what I heard. I'm not yes. satisfied heard. with placing fifth. I'm satisfied with being the highest placing person in, this person in the room. Number three, <laughs> Sony's Ghostbusters Frozen Empire remained in third place with $5.3 million from over... 3,300 theaters. After four weeks on the big screen, the sci-fi comedy sequel has generated $96 million at the domestic box office and $160 million worldwide. A so-so result for the $100 million budgeted film. That does not include any sort of marketing or press campaigns. Uh, we keep talking about the same movies every week on Monday because there's so few movies that are coming out. And it feels like we're about to go through a little bit of a drought here. I don't think the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare is going to do well, great title, by the way. At all at the theater. Super easy to say. I don't think there's much demand for this. I don't think Abigail is going to draw a lot of blood at the box office. You go from the gentleman 
to the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. It's like, how many yeah. words can we add to gentlemen to make it as complicated as possible? Can I say one thing about the box office? You may bring this up. But I will. I will look, bring this up probably. I'm looking at it. Can I say how much I love that a Shrek 2 re-release beat a movie like Sting? <laughs> I did see that, that was Shrek 20. 2 was being re-released, and I thought about going to see that it. That was 20 minutes of conversation that you just destroyed in uh, one sentence. I sorry. hope you're happy with yourself. You Shreked it. Yeah. <laughs> Number four. It's all ogre. Oh, wow. <laughs> Pretty good, Tyler. I like that. That was good. What a jackass. <laughs> Tyler um, wins. Uh, Get it? Uh, donkey. Donkey. Uh, yeah. I've, hey, Ty- donkey. Ty- Tyler still wins. Good job, Tyler. Thank you. Of course Tyler wins. Don't let him... Look, Tyler, I don't think you understand this, right? We're both fighting for custody of your <laughs> affection. And I just hope that you don't just give it to him because he compliments you randomly on the show. I hope you remember who treats you like the pearl in which you are every single week. By the way, you saw the movie X. I did. I this, did. I watched it last weekend. night. Vin Diesel. It was uh, real out there, but yeah. uh, pretty good. X and Pearl and Maxine, and Tyler's working his way up to that. I may go into Maxine without having seen the other two. I may do that. You're going to be forced to do that, it seems, John. Well, I've already seen Pearl. Oh, okay. But uh, I do not want to watch X, absolutely. But I'm sure I'll see Maxine anyway. Number four, Universal and DreamWork, uh, DreamWorks Animation's Kung Fu Panda 4 moved up to the number four spot with $5.2 million in its sixth weekend. So far, the animated family film has grossed $173 million in North America, more than $452 million globally. Kung Fu Panda 4 cost $85 million, so it's well-positioned here in its theatrical run. At number five, still a part of the top five, Dune Part 2. Rounding out the top five, it is the highest-grossing movie of the year. It added another piece to the pie as you have, what was it, how much was... uh? added this past weekend that's what i don't have i probably should have that the sci-fi epic has amassed uh 4.3 4.3 million i had for some reason 74.3 million down and i don't know why it's a good weekend the sci-fi epic has amassed 272 million in north america and 683 million dollars globally it will be one of the highest grossing movies of the year but i think that you're about to have some releases in the summer that will trounce it and we'll see if that holds up i think 684 overall so Yes. Doing, doing pretty good. It is. It's much higher than I thought I was going to get. At number six, Tyler, uh, make, help me understand this. Mm-hmm. Dropping a near 60% at 59%, that's Monkey Man, down to the number six spot, making $4.1 million over the weekend. Obviously, this was a low-risk, sort of low-reward proposition that Universal had by picking up the rights to this film. But Dev Patel's Monkey Man, it doesn't seem like word of mouth is helping this movie retain any sort of momentum at the box office. Uh, no, it's, it's a revenge movie. There's people who are into that and people who just aren't going to be into the really gruesome revenge movies. Your Kill Bill's old boy. So I get it, but I also it's a good think movie. Civil War coming out and being the number one spot took away some of Monkey Man's audience because I feel like it plays to a very similar demo. I'll be honest, of the top really? seven movies, yeah, I've seen stuff on social media outside of this room of people talking about all of them. I have not seen a word about Monkey Man outside of the two of you going well, to see I it. I think the marketing campaign for Monkey Man has been abysmal. It I has really been. Do. The, the quality of the trailer that we got was great, but there's been... Nobody's seen it, though. No push. The marketing this was this from producer Jordan Peele. Yeah. The end. Well, when you swoop in and you're the savior of a project, you get that sort of... But that's all they did, really. And it's like, that probably put as much money as there was, but that's Don't you think audiences are smart enough to know the difference between from producer Jordan Peele and from director Jordan Peele? Like, no, no, no. I I think general audiences know. Then why would they put it? That's why you see, like, from the minds of. Right, I'm saying it's not working. That these little tricks are not working anymore. That's what I'm saying. I think it has double the money it would have made otherwise. If you had the exact same marketing and the let exact me, same release without it, but... Be more specific here in what I'm trying to say. When something's being marketed as being produced by Jordan Peele, it does not have nearly the cultural impact as something that's being directed Correct. by Jordan Peele. That's what I'm trying to say. I think he would get behind it more if he was directing it. it, it I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would hope so. I don't think audiences so. get excited for from producer Jordan Peele. I think they get excited for what's Jordan Peele's next movie. Yeah. That's all I care about. The worst was there's a movie called Antebellum that came out a couple years ago, and it said from the producers of, and it listed multiple Jordan Peele movies like Stranger Things and like a bunch of different horror properties that are gigantic, and it was not Jordan Peele. It was not the Duffer Brothers. It was not anybody that was even remotely nameable from those. It was random people. 
that just like, hey, I was like the fifth person that gave ten dollars to the movie, mm-hmm. and so I'm producing this one too, and it bombed. And their entire marketing was, we're gonna name all these big movies mixed in the two minutes of the trailer every ten seconds. It's there's, there's gonna be another thing. Like and, and Blumhouse does that too. And I've always very interested every time a Blumhouse movie comes out, which ones they choose. Right. Depending on the movie. So like for Imaginary, they chose certain movies and left certain movies out. It's like I'm kinda surprised they didn't mention this one, but like they throw in Five Nights at Freddy's, but then they leave out like Black Phone or Halloween or any other, a lot of other big stuff that he's done. It's always kinda interesting how they pick and choose certain things put in there, but none of it for the most part seems to work. Civil War, violent R-rated movie. Monkey Man, a violent R-rated movie. They're they're really trying to reach a lot of the same audience. The First Omen, a violent R-rated movie as well. It dropped 54% and it ended up in the seventh spot. It just cannot topple Monkey Man, even though I think it's the superior film. I just, I think people are burnt out a little bit on the creepy nun movies right now. There's just been too many of them and too short of a span. And there's also the genre necessarily, the Omen doesn't have as much of a following as a lot of other different genres within or a lot of other different properties within the horror genre have. It doesn't have that built-in following that maybe was expected here. It was supposed to be straight to streaming as well. Monkey Man was supposed to go straight to Netflix. The first Omen was supposed to go straight to Hulu. And it will end up on Hulu and people will start to realize, like, oh, this is a really good movie for what it is. It's got a lot of body horror. I, I think the first Omen is done expertly. I agree with you. It's a good movie, but The Omen as a franchise has always kind of been second banana to The Exorcist. You're right. And so when you when you get to 2024, like (laughs) second banana, I got it. Uh, So now in 2024, (laughs) sorry, go ahead. Uh, Now in 2024, The Omen just is looked back as like a classic, but it doesn't have that cultural staying power that the exorcist has that pet cemetery has or other franchises number eight a film called the long game number nine as john mentioned shrek 2 which was a re-release and the fact that shrek 2 is in the top 10 Mm. in 2024 tells you everything you know about (laughs) need to know about how many actual movies there are out and i think that this is a direct effect of the writer's strike can you do a gingerbread man or pinocchio impression from the shrek movies have you gotten to that point with cord where you can imitate those can i do an honest admission oh, never gosh. Seen shrek. never oh, seen no. the shrek movies never seen one shrek movie oh okay that's Come on. all i that's okay we're not going to shame you for that there's movies we haven't <laughs> no. seen that everybody else has seen nor any of the toy story movies what <laughs> get out i've seen that one i didn't like it <laughs> <laughs> directed by jordan Peele. Yeah. that's right at number 10, a movie I can't pronounce, Sugar August D Tour D-Day. See, oh, that's, that's a- the uh, BTS concert film. Ooh. Oh. Well, it made $2.2 million overall after a $990.8,000 weekend, making the top 10 spot. But as John mentioned, in its first week out, in 750 theaters, Sting came in 14th place. This is a movie you despise. And here's what I had to think, John. When I saw this information that Sting had bombed the way it did it's probably due to tyler writing the very first letterboxd review of this movie what and just mean? giving it a half a star i think yes I, eviscerated I, it. I i had the first ever letterbox review for sting not a single other review on imdb rotten tomatoes letterbox nothing you saw it on the screen unseen I scream did. unseen which is why you were able to have that early review and you decided you were so passionate about how much you hated this movie that you would write a review and you scorched it. And that, there you go. You landed it in 14th place. Everyone read your review and said, I can skip this. <laughs> wow. Well, hey, Good. The average Good. score is 2.7. So uh, I, I guess people a little bit, but a lot, I think a lot more people saw it as so bad. It's good and gave it some credit there, but I, it was just so bad that it was completely boring. I heard me. one review that said that it kind of took inspiration from Little Shop of Horrors a little bit. Ooh, I like that film. I guess it's because Audrey got fed, and I guess this is a pet that gets fed or something, and it grows big. And That's about it. Okay, there we go. At the mainland China box office, The Boy and the Heron reached a $93 million total after a second weekend on top of the charts there. That's another movie, Tyler, I know you absolutely loved. Yes, I believe it deserved the Oscar over Spider-Verse, not out of an enjoyment factor, but just out of making a technically complete movie. I don't think you can award the middle section of a trilogy uh, uh, an award for Best Picture. Ooh, I, like how it's, I like how it's... Just I mean, cross the so river. It's time for the flop. So, it's already won an Oscar, so, you know, it's okay. But 
I was <laughs> not because it was a good movie, but because it was a technically sound movie. In other words, Civil War should win every Oscar. Uh, Tyler. No, because that's missing one of the biggest parts of movies. What I just is, heard is was John story. admitted that Civil War is not a good movie. That's what I just No, heard. I'm just saying that yeah, by, by that standard, all of y'all should be loving Civil War. I mean, it wasn't good. Rockstar's been sort of a defender along with you that yeah, you didn't need on your side. You, you're, now you're throwing him under the bus? What's yeah. going on here? I'm not, even the, river. I'm not even the biggest Studio Ghibli fan, but Boy in the Heron was a master class for Miyazaki films. This is him executing all of his tricks, all of his signature looks to the fullest. So, the Boy on Heroin is supposed to be good. <laughs> Supposedly. Yeah. Uh, speaking, You of, watched it, John. I've seen it. It was good, not great, but... <laughs> It's not as good as the uh, Amazing Spider-Man verse. Uh, Into the Spider Verse is is currently one of the greatest trilogies that, if it, as long as it, if it lands at all, will be the greatest trilogy ever, unless then Dune tops it. Speaking of drug usage and kids' movies, we just did a retro trailer reaction to Kindergarten Cop that will drop later today on the channel. So make sure you are tuned in for that. That was the one that was magically pulled out of the Dune popcorn bucket. On Friday, we all watched it over the weekend and we shared our thoughts and we cannot wait to hear from you in the comment section there. If you're a fan of Kindergarten Cop, make sure you check out that. It actually holds up rather well and I really enjoyed revisiting that movie this past weekend. Variety published a recap about Succession, the television show that, John, we both know and love. Did you ever get into Succession, Rockstar, at all? Did you ever have time to watch that? It was that? one of those ones where I watched the first episode. I really enjoyed it. And I never watched another episode. I didn't have anything. It's just one of those things where I just forgot about it. And then they talk, the guys in the next round talked about it every single Monday. And it just got to the point where, like, this is annoying. This is annoying. This is annoying. I, like, it just where it kind of like makes you not want to watch it. But I still want to give it a second chance. Nothing it, against it. I wasn't like one of those guys. Like, oh, I'll tell you what. The first episode was great, but I just never watched the second. John, this is a show that actually unites us. We've both been on this bandwagon for a long time. And it went out with one final bang winning two Writers Guild of America awards on Sunday night, the most of any series for best drama series and also for best drama episode. Creator Jesse Armstrong was on hand in New York to accept the award, while several of the show's writers were also in L.A. to accept the honor. This is officially the final major award show where Succession, which ended its run last May, was still eligible Besides Best Drama, the show also won the Episodic Drama Prize for the episode Living Plus. Do you remember that episode? It was written by Georgia Pritchett and Will Arbery. Where he had to come out and present yep. at the, yeah. This is the one where Kendall has to make the product launch at a big event, yeah. where a video of Logan is used to promise two times the growth in Waystar Ro Royco's park division. And one of my favorite moments of that is when it's obviously video manipulation that he's using... Logan to talk about that it's going to be a booming business and Greg who was in charge cousin Greg who was in charge of having to make sure that that video was edited and putting a lot of pressure a lot of pressure on the editor ended up saying right after it plays like everybody's upset like oh my gosh I can't believe he did that oh my gosh that's awful and then he's like but it was really well edited wasn't it and it's a really <laughs> quick line but it's so super funny when you think back to Succession and its legacy, John, it's a show that we have parted ways with for basically a year now, but it's going to go down as one of those all-timers. And for a lot of different reasons, I, I actually hope they never spin it off or they never do anything else with it. I hope that it's just the masterclass that it is because under Jesse Armstrong's supervision, this never reached a weak point. It was strong throughout. It ended at the right time. I mean, obviously, when they announce the show's ending, you never want a show that you love to end. But I compare this to Game of Thrones. So Game of Thrones probably went a little too long because they didn't know how to land the plane at the end. Um, Benioff and Weiss, that is. And George R. R. Martin didn't give, didn't give him a lot of help either. But the biggest thing about that was who's going to end up on the throne. And going into that final season, I mean, you and I went around when we were in radio and we asked everybody, we saw these videos, who's going to end up on the throne? Everybody had everybody to guess, but... Really and truly, there were a lot of people who, if they ended up on the throne, would be a negative. And I would say Bran ending up on the throne ultimately was a negative to most people. With this, it's the exact same thing. It's who ends up on the throne at the end, who ultimately ends up with the company. That this is the only other show that has done that successfully. But it's also a show I feel like that almost no matter who ended up on the throne, you could see it. Because who ends up on the throne here isn't necessarily the top choice. You're thinking, oh, it's going to be one of the kids. It's going to be this person. It's going to be that person. And... I think this did a really good job of making it where, wow, 
literally any of the 20 people that it could potentially be, you could see it. A, you could see it and make it believable, and B, you wouldn't hate it necessarily as long as they did it the right way, and I think they did it the right way, and they put a good person on the throne at the end to wrap it up and into a nice, neat little bow and make it work. What an ensemble. Just the entire family, everybody playing their part so perfect. All the different side characters. And a good mix of old and new people, too. Like, Brian Cox has already been around for a while. Uh, Kieran Culkin, at least the name Culkin, has been around for a long time, and he's kind of been in and out for a while. But, like, I didn't know who Sarah Snook was. And so that's a new person. I didn't know who uh, Tom was. I didn't know who all, you know Matthew McFadden, which now he's in Deadpool and he's starting to grow. Sarah Snook is starting to appear in more too. Like there's a lot of kind of mix of like, I know that person. I already knew Jeremy Strong, but like he's I'm, growing even more. My buddy, Alan Ruck. Alan Ruck. You, everybody, everybody knew probably before even Brian Cox uh, being the oldest one, but it's a good mix kind of growing. Like uh, uh, Patrick Wilson's wife was in it. Um, I'm just totally blanking on her name now. Uh, Carolina was... Patrick Wilson's wife. And I didn't realize that until my wife pointed it out. And now she's popping up and everything. Like there's all kind of people in it that it's like growing careers, reigniting careers, like people like Alan Ruck and people who already had giant careers like Brian Cox anyway. I just never got to a point where I felt on screen that all of these people hated each other, even though Jeremy Strong was sort of ostracized from the group. And whether how intentional that was, because Kendall is sort of ostracized from the group. Yeah. And, you know, there were certain hit pieces about him, certain – there's just a different tone in his performance, and he's sort of the one that didn't have that awards moment. And the show does not work without his performance as Kendall Roy. And I just think the show has a tremendous legacy, and it's one that I can't wait to try to forget about and rewatch at some point and go through each and every episode. But such a smart show and one that deserves all the acclaim in which it has gotten, this being sort of the last round of that. Big winners on the film side included American Fiction, a movie I still have yet to see. Is it streaming anywhere yet? American Fiction that you guys know of? Um, I because if it is, it hasn't really promoted. It hasn't really been promoted too well that it's out there streaming somewhere. I tried to watch this movie in theaters multiple times, just couldn't make the showtimes work. It was like one showtime a day, and it would just never quite work for me. But I really wanted to see American Fiction and didn't get the opportunity to. Yeah, you had to go out of your way to see it here. No. Yeah, it is. Did. I saw it Los, Los Angeles when I went to the Rose Bowl because it was so much easier out there. It says on MGM Plus. Yeah, and Fubo. <laughs> MGM Plus. I didn't even Which know there was an MGM Plus. Owned by uh, Amazon, so oh, I don't know. Okay. So can you just get it through Prime, though? No, because I went to Prime and it said, <sighs> launch MGM Plus, get a seven-day free trial. So get you a seven-day free trial, see what else on MGM Plus, and go for it. This movie is being held from me so much. Uh, let's talk about The Holdovers. That was written by David Hemmingson, and it won original screenplay, while American Fiction won adapted screenplay. Other major winners include the comedy series for FX's The Bear, limited series for Netflix's Beef, and the new series for HBO's The Last of Us, and comedy variety talk show series for HBO's Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Really quickly, The Holdovers is a film that I plan to rewatch come Christmas again. Have you seen The Holdovers yet, Tyler? I haven't. Uh, everybody in the office says it's an amazing movie, one of the best of the year, should have gotten Best Picture, everything like that. So, Well, I do not believe it should have gotten Best Picture. Well, but I I've do heard it from some other people in the office. I have no doubt about that, including John Lunsford, who's not an, he's an Oppen hater. But Only because Spider-Man was nominated for Best Picture. I guess well, it's Boy on Heroin. <laughs> Boy on Heroin was also not nominated for Best Picture. I, I think The Holdovers is fantastic, and it's going to become a, a really a Christmas classic. I still get upset about The Bear being labeled under comedy series. There's nothing about so that series. I actually pulled it up because we were talk, talking about Succession. I pulled the Wikipedia page up just to kind of have information about it. And it's listed now as a satirical comedy drama series, which I don't. I would not disagree with. But then I went, okay, let me see what The Bear is labeled as. It's now labeled. It has not been labeled this because I have looked a million times during all award season to see this, the last two seasons to see this. And it's now listed as a comedy drama series. It is not. It is a full-on drama. Succession is funnier than The Bear is and more of a comedy than it is. And obviously, it won every drama category. Um, I mean, hey, do what you can to win all the awards, I guess, because it won every comedy award, but uh, not a comedy. It won't be long before The Bear wins an Abbey. Limited series for <laughs> Netflix is Beef. Uh, I haven't seen Beef. Uh, there's a new series for HBO's you know, The Last of Us, which, who knows, may be coming up on Lunce's list. We'll have to see. And then last week tonight with John Oliver... Perhaps the biggest surprise of the night for comedy variety sketch series was Netflix's I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson beating out Saturday Night Live. Did any of you watch Saturday Night Live from this past weekend? I have not Nope. Yet. I've seen the uh, 
Beavis and Butthead thing. That's all I've seen too. Yeah, I like I didn't see the sketch. I just saw Ryan Gosling as Beavis. Ryan Gosling was on SNL. Gosling brought back Kate McKinnon to revive that Close Encounters sketch, and it really is funny. Yeah. I've seen almost all of those, but I wasn't really in the mood to watch another one. It got recommended to me by someone, and I immediately watched it, and it's super funny. If you the physical comedy in that sketch is hilarious. And one of the sketches where you guys have already mentioned it is the Beavis and Butthead parody that has gone viral and obviously making a lot of Beavis and Butthead fans happy. Were you ever into Beavis and Butthead? Uh, I was. I just remember when it came out, I think I was in sixth grade, uh, P.E., when you're doing your pre-stretches, every single boy was doing a Beavis and Butthead impression. And it's like a bitch, the sixth grade is going, ha, 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 ha. Like, she's like, it, it, it's awful. I remember everybody tried, and I like this, the teacher. Okay, children. <laughs> you know, I wonder how the writers come up with, hey, who's hosting this week? Ryan Gosling. We should turn him into Beavis. Like, how on earth do you come up with that? Some there, of the stuff that all these writers over the years have come up with is incredible, but it's like, Ryan Gosling, who's like, you know, world's sexiest man out there, biggest actor on the planet right now. Let's do a Beavis and butt. What? Where on earth did you get that from? Let's give him a big prosthetic nose. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Because what they say, Tina Fey says this and Conan O'Brien says this. In the writer's room, I think you have the writer's room at first, like on a Monday. And Tuesday's the worst day. I think Tuesday or Wednesday, you meet with the host and pitch ideas. And then people, he's, she like, everybody, you're so competitive that you want to get your sketch in. And just randomly somebody will throw something stupid like oh beavis or something like that and then somebody like actually that'd be kind of funny because nobody's heard them in a while and then like we can get makeup in on it and stuff like that and if the host is like okay but if it's like paris hilton like i'm not doing that so it's just it all depends on the host if they're like open mind like tom hanks is supposed to be like i'll do whatever y'all want me to do it seems like gosling is the same type that's a top 10 paris hilton impression by the way (laughs) that's hot that's hot (laughs) top tier there (laughs) hbo max by the way uh, led the award show with all outlets, uh, with five awards, followed by Netflix with three. And it's really HBO slash Max because they don't call it HBO Max anymore. I think that was one of the dumbest things I've ever seen is them getting rid of the HBO in front of Max. I understand why they did it, but I'm always going to call it HBO Max. Like, I still call it Troy State a lot instead I call of Troy it, University. Like, there's I, just certain things like that that you just can't do. I still call it HBO Go. I'm not going <laughs> to oh, stop. yeah. I forgot about HBO <laughs> yeah. Go. And that, was, that was the OG just yeah. in reverse. This, Ayo. <clears throat> this rep the first. The OG. This rep the first. Uh, just play the Pittsburgh thing. People want it. Just <laughs> oh, play it. Ah. Pittsburgh. This rep the first <laughs> WGA awards following last year's 148 day strike, which also led to the decision to delay the year ceremony until April, a month after the Oscars. A couple of changes from last week that I didn't get to when it comes to Lionsgate and theatrical releases. They've decided that they are going to budge and they are going to move the crow. It is no longer going to be coming out in early June. It is now coming out in August, August 23rd of this year. The crow moved because they didn't want to go head to head with bad boys, ride or die, which also opens up in that early June slot. Mm. So they decided to move. It's when it's now moved to August 23rd of 2024. He's going to have crow's feet by the time that comes out. Comedy, not our forte here. Much like the bear. Oh, Saw 11 was expected oh to be released on September 27th of this year. It was one of my most anticipated. It was my fourth most anticipated movie of the year. The way all are with Fast and Furious, I am with Saw. Yeah. What would you oh, Every okay. time another Fast and Furious yeah. comes out, oh, there's yeah, another you heard Fast that and backwards. Furious. Took, I did hear it backwards. I was like, wait, you're a Saw fan now? When no, did you? The way all are about me of Fast and Furious, I am about Saw. Okay. There's Got another it. Fast and Furious. There's another Saw movie. Sorry. So and, Saw 11. And Rocky's that way with all of them. Saw oh, yeah. 11 is, is being pushed from September 27th of this year to September 26th of 2025. Is that in, is 11 including the one that was just called Spiral? Or is that considered I, a spinoff? Well, it's in the Saw universe here, Tyler. When, when, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember which ones. The one they started getting away from this was Saw 3D, I believe. And then you had Jigsaw. And then they stopped titling them then, with numbers. Spiral I, was the one with Chris Rock, right? Yeah. It was, yes. Speaking of Bad Boys for Life. Six, seven, eight. Bad nine, Boys that is, that is counting. So yeah. Saw 6, then Saw 3D, Jigsaw, Spiral, Saw 10. There you go. So yes. So yes, that counts Spiral, I guess. 11 effing movies. <laughs> By the way, going to the dentist shouldn't feel like a jigsaw trap. Okay. What? It should be something where pain management is a top priority, and that is the top priority for the team at Alabama Dental. I'm so happy to have a dental team and finding a solution To my dental care needs, located on Grants Mill Road, you can trust Dr. Jeff and Dr. Brian. Make sure, first and foremost, that their patients 
are always comfortable with the dental care in which they are receiving. They have all the latest dental care technology, so you know you're receiving the most advanced care possible. But it's really the friendliness of the staff. They always have smiles. They're always happy to see you. They make sure you're up to date, whether it's through phone calls or texts on your upcoming appointments. They work with you and help you feel at ease knowing you're taking care of yourself the right way. There's always a sense of accomplishment after visiting Alabama Dental Associates. For more information or to make an appointment, you can call them at 205-956-8977 or visit my friends at alabamadental.com as they look forward to seeing you. Okay, it's now time for another edition of Luntz's List. We all grew up with a controller in our hand and we now seem to be in the golden age of video game to screen adaptations. With notable properties gaining more and more fans as they flesh out their stories on either the silver or small screen, we have asked this question of which games have been translated the most efficiently. Let's get ready to discuss the personal picks on another brand new edition of Luntz's List. By the way, speaking of Ryan Gosling, we have that Laurel's list up for you to watch, talking about her favorite Ryan Gosling movies. Speaking of... Our retro trailer reactions, we've got that Kindergarten Cop video that is going to be dropping for you later today. We'll also have a Fallout series review for us, or season one review, I should say, dropping later today on the channel. Tons of content for sure, but right now it's time to get to what are, John, the five most proficient video game to screen adaptations in your professional opinion. So this is definitely going to be a different list than most people. Uh, I'm not basing this on success, I'm basing this on A, my love of the game, and B, how well the game is actually adapted to the screen. Right. Um, Proficient. Because I think word. that is the thing with Fallout is a very good adaptation from what the game was. Now, general audiences is, is a second part of this that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And I think Fallout, it worked for the most part. But um, there's, there's two names that make multiple appearances on this list um, from Fallout. So we'll see what those are. I don't, I don't know what that means. Well, you have to wait. I guess that's, uh, that's, that's what, called a tease. It's the business. They call that a tease. <laughs> okay. We'll also take your reaction in the chat of what do you think were the most proficiently executed adaptations from video game world to television or to movies. We would love to hear from you in the chat. And also, while you're here, give us a thumbs up. We'd appreciate it. It really helps the channel growth for sure. Starting off with a controversial pick for anyone who's seen that movie. I feel like that one was either loved or hated. Well, polarizing and i was on the love side and it was loved by people that are warcraft fans it was hated by everybody that's not a warcraft fan because warcraft is a complicated universe to get right so duncan jones behind this yes um good pull however there's one person who uh is the same as fallout and that would be ramin jawadi i love ramin did the music for game of thrones house of the dragon westworld and fallout and Warcraft did the music for this as well. Warcraft has an incredible soundtrack from the game. Um, but this is a long, complicated universe that has been built over five or six games, really and truly, if you count some spinoffs. Um, but World of Warcraft is my game. I've been playing it for 20 years now. It came out in 2004. They're celebrating the 20th anniversary this year. Um, I played Warcraft 3 a little bit, but I'm not a big real-time strategy guy. But this is kind of like a prequel to what we know in World of Warcraft. So it doesn't even follow the actual story that you have in World of Warcraft. So I can understand why people go and see it and see, you know, tons of characters that we've known from the game, like Gul'dan, Blackhand, Durotan. Yeah, Durotan. I'm saying all the names to see what Rocky's face yeah. looks like. Because you see all that and you're like, I have no earthly idea what's going Don't on right care. here. Don't yeah. But I understand what's going on and I loved it. It was the highest grossing video game film of all time until... Um, I'm trying to think. I think Detective Pikachu just barely passed it. And then, of course, Mario blew everything out of the water, out, out of the water um, this past summer. But, no, uh, Warcraft, I think, is a very well-done movie for the Warcraft universe, which when it comes to adapting from 
video game to movie or TV. That is what is most important to me. And so it worked for Warcraft fans. Speaking of the character Duraflame, you can <laughs> get Tim in it if you do a prequel call it Civil Warcraft. Think about it. This already was a prequel, so it probably should be after the fact. After they've had the conflict, uh, fighting this, with each this other. Is Duraflame hey, as the uh, honestly, president. Warcraft is one giant civil war on Azeroth between the Horde and Alliance. Oh, everybody knows about Azeroth. We'd been asking for a while, which of the next round guys would not be the one to mock us on this show? And we came up with Rockstar. We said Rockstar would be a fun addition to this. And then what I've realized is Rockstar's mocking us on this show. No, I am not. You certainly are. I am not. We're going to get through it, though. It's okay. We're going we're gonna to make it through. If Assassin's Creed's not on here, it's going to be <laughs> your AWS. Let's go. That's actually quite funny. Let's go to number four on Luntz's list. If Warcraft is five, and I know John loves Warcraft, these four have to be. Warcraft also made my five biggest franchises. I know. Uh, of all time. I just, these other four have to be real bangers because John loves Warcraft. I'm surprised it actually is not higher on the list. I just type it as wow. That's what a lot of people call it. All out, boy. All out. Okay. We are less than a week from when this thing was released, and it's already made Luntz's list of five best mm. video game adaptations of all time with Fallout, the series that you can watch on Amazon Prime. It's one of the only few series that have uh, the actual game developers as the production company on this. Todd as, Howard is executive as did Warcraft. producer. As did Warcraft. Oh, wow. um, yes, Todd Howard is a, from uh, Bethesda is on this. Now, let me say this. Fallout could probably be higher if I was a fan of Fallout the game. I ran through Fallout 3 when it first came out, and one playthrough, and I said, okay, I'm done. Never played it again, never touched New Vegas, never touched Fallout 4, never touched Fallout 76. Never played any of them, not my style of game overall. I'm more of an Elder Scrolls guy. I was obsessed with Morrowinds, Oblivion, of course Skyrim has been out and come out 5,000 different times, I feel like, from Bethesda, and Elder Scrolls 6 is in the works. Not a big Elder Scrolls Online fan, though. Um, but while I'm not in love with the game, I am in love with the lore behind the game of the kind of retro futuristic style behind it um you know obviously westworld one of my favorite or it is my favorite tv show of all time i'll fight anybody that season one of westworld's the best television season television ever but this didn't quite get there but it at least kind of sort of put some duct tape over that westworld size hole in my heart um with jonathan nolan lisa joy and yeah ramin jawadi ramin jawadi yep did you see some parallels between the Man in Black from Westworld and, and the, ghoul the Ghoul from yes. this series, yes, I did. Um, a little Dolores as well uh, with her and Lucy, um, but I actually really liked Maximus in this show. Um, the whole Brotherhood of Steel storyline, I'd love to see more. I'd love to see a prequel for that of how that exactly came to be. He kind of sort of halfway explains it to her, um, but that's a no-name actor coming in that I thought did pretty good almost kind of reminds me seeing him at first of kind of what I saw in like Jonathan majors at first as an actor. Um, Hey, they need a new King. If, if you uh, want to go audition for that, but um, you know, this could be a huge jumping off point for somebody like that. Whereas Walter Goggins is already really big. And if you're just joining us, we won't be getting into any, to any real deep spoilers here or fallout. We'll give you general reactions, but we are doing a spoiler filled review of season one. We've binged through it all. And we'll have that up for you on the channel. But I think it's safe to know that if you're working your way through the series, we're not going to spoil anything here with you. I just think Walton Goggins was excellent in this series. It was performance. His performance was an award. It will be an award contender. I believe it will end up winning him an Emmy, but we'll see. We'll have to see what the rest of the lay of the land looks like. Not as good as baby Billy, baby Billy in this last season of the righteous gemstones was incredible. And I hope he gets some award recognition for that because it's past what this last series there, was. There's one word that comes to mind when I think of Walton Goggins, and that is versatility. He has it. He can make any small part radiate off the screen, literally. And <laughs> I, I think it's fantastic what he does. Even in a role like being a horror junkie, House of a Thousand Corpses, Walton Goggins is in that for like a split second. But he elevates that so much, just being able to sort of steal scenes. There's a couple of guys that when they – come into a role they can steal any scene they're in and in Walton Goggins is one of those and it's my least favorite of the three Danny McBride Jody Hill is that his name yes David, David Gordon Green yes. series that they've done on HBO uh East Beyond Down is probably still number one for me then Righteous Gemstones then Vice Principals yeah. but what makes Vice Principals an underrated show to me even though I feel like I got a lot of hate 
was Walton Goggins being basically as much of a main character as uh, Danny McBride is in that show. Okay, so let's continue on with this list. This is what are the five most proficient video game to screen, whether it's film or TV adaptations, in John's professional opinion. John is a gamer. John is also an ingester of all things entertainment. So when these two things cross paths and one medium becomes another, what works? At number four was Fallout. Number five, Warcraft. Number three. Hello. Is it me you're looking for? Yes, it is. (laughs) Master Chief in the green there. Halo. So this is a television series that's now on its second season. Is that correct, John? Just finished season two on Paramount+. Plus. Um, and I hear season two was much better than yeah, season one. Yeah, because I thought you'd trash season one. Did you not? I didn't trash it. I had to learn to love season one. When I first started, here's the thing. Master Chief, uh, I, may be, I honestly haven't finished the campaign of Halo Infinite, but outside of that, I don't think we've ever seen Master Chief's face in the game. We saw his eyes if you beat Halo 4 on Legendary, and I think that's the only thing we've ever seen of his face because they show him taking the the armor off and you just see like a quick shot of his eyes. But in this one, literally in the first episode, and I already knew who was playing him, but literally in the first episode, he takes his helmet off and you see it's Porn Stash from Orange is the the New Black. Like, that's his name. (laughs) I think that's probably his biggest role is is Orange is the New Black. He was like the main guard in that. And his nickname was Porn Stash in that because he had a, a mustache like that. And I'm like, Master Chief is Porn Stash? What is this? And I instantly was like, nope, done, and didn't watch past the first episode. Then I thought, okay, I'm a Halo defender. I got to go finish this. And I finished it, and it actually was pretty good. There's one scene in it, really, that I would take out of the first season and be like, what the hell is wrong with y'all? There's a Master Chief sex scene in it yes. that you start asking what? a lot of questions. I know. Yeah. You start asking a lot of questions. But ultimately, the overarching story was pretty good. Season two comes along, and you realize, okay, that was well-viewed enough, probably. It got enough people to subscribe to Paramount+. Plus. Now we're going to give it a budget. And now it looks totally different because it has tons of money poured into it. And I still still have a couple episodes to go because it just finished. And I got kind of behind with all the various movies and TV shows we're consuming. But episode four of season two is one of the best episodes. Maybe the best, probably the second best video game episode I've seen. It's a full-on invasion war episode. You can tell they spent the vast majority of their budget in this episode. It has incredible character development in it. It is awesome, and it is everything a Halo person wants to be. The other thing I had to get past with Halo, this is a different timeline. This is not the game timeline. So they started the Silver timeline, which is what this is. This, And they basically said, look, we're doing what the MCU did. The MCU does not pull from the comic books. It uses the comic books as inspiration for ultimately the story it tells. If you were to read the Infinity War story in the comic books, it's way different than what it ends up being in the movie. But... The basics are the same. Thanos snaps, half the people disappear, they got to get them back. That's the very bare bones basics of it. Halo did the same thing. Master Chief still exists. Cortana still exists. Uh, the UNSC still exists. But outside, and the Covenant still exists. Outside of that, it's kind of its own story. So you kind of had to get past that and realize, oh, they're using some inspiration from the game, but it's not just following exactly what the game is. And so with that, I've been able to, okay, I can believe it. I can enjoy it. Season two has been really, really good so far. Like I said, I got a couple episodes left because it just finished um, doing weekly releases, so I couldn't binge it, and I'll finish it. We'll probably talk about that in our Fallout Season 1 review of whether or not it would have benefited from being something that you could watch weekly compared to all at once. But John and I have very different, different, different opinions, I should say, on that strategy of release, and I have a feeling we'll hash it out there yet again. A lot of people confuse us as having a lot of the same opinions on things, but John, I can tell you that that is far from the case, and you know it as well. All you got to do is watch one episode of this, and we'll be yelling at each other in no time. Probably so. Let's go on to number two, looking at those best video game adaptations to the small screen or to the silver screen. And we're getting a lot of your reactions in here on the chat. We're going to get to those. I just don't want to potentially spoil anything that may be up there for John. Good pull, John. I saw this one in the chat. Arcane. I know nothing about this. No. Arcane is a Netflix animated TV show around League of Legends. It's officially called Arcane League of Legends. Yeah. Um, League of Legends is a game on PC that came out in 2010, I believe. Um, that is a 5v5 MOBA. It was on my free-to-play game uh, list as one of the five best games. When the game originally started... Um, it was basically you played a summoner and you summoned 
your character to go out in the world, 5v5, fight each other, try to destroy the other base. That was basically it. They didn't have writers. They didn't have a story behind it. And then they realized we probably need to develop a little more behind this. They hired writers, a lot of artists to kind of develop a world around it. And since then, they've grown that world. Uh, They still don't really explain a lot of it in the game. When you buy a character, it'll tell you its backstory, but that's about it. Um, But they've done so in alternative media forms, including this TV show. Um, It takes place around two main characters, Vi and Jinx. Vi played by Haley Steinfeld. Jinx played by Ella Purnell from Fallout. Fallout. The other one that is from Fallout. Um, So she plays the main character in this as well. Um, But it's an incredible animated series. Um, It's... I'm trying to describe the animation style. It's almost like hand-drawn computer-generated. And it's not not in the way that, like, not in the way across the Spider-Verse or the Spider-Verse movies are. Definitely not in the way, like, Ninja Turtles has done. It, it's a unique art form of its own, which has also helped. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it hurts, depending on what it is. Those two examples being prime examples of that. Um, but, you know, the universe in general pulls a lot of things in. It pulls in, you know, Lovecraftian stuff. It pulls in general sword and sorcery fantasy stuff. Um, but it's a really good series and it's around basically those two characters, their sisters, um, kind of growing up in the underbelly and then going on to, uh, one becoming good, one becoming bad essentially. And anyway, it's a really good show. I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix. Sounds like you are Second all season about it. coming in November, I believe You're at the number two spot. Do you want to get into honorable mentions before you get to number one? Or? I feel like we know what your number one is. <sighs> you probably do. I'm going to get them honorable mentions first. So there's one notable, I guess the most notable one missing from the list, and that is Mario. Highest grossing, by far, obviously. For me, the nerd who's gone here, through here and explained all this random stuff that Rocky doesn't know what the heck I'm talking about. I know what, I know what Asgoth <laughs> is. I've been to Asgoth. Uh, as a Roth. That's what um, I just said. There wasn't enough of that in Mario for me because you got to make it work for kids. And I 100% get that. I'm not blaming anything Mario did whatsoever. But for me, I want you to go full on everything I know about Mario, full on Smash Brothers universe, which they probably are going to end up doing because it may bank. There's just enough where it's like, oh, I wanted to go this one step further, and it didn't because you're getting a little too in the weeds at that point. You sound like me sort of talking about Civil War here. Like, I needed it to give me more. I did. Sure. Um, <laughs> Play anyway. the Pittsburgh thing again. Uh, I missed it. Hold on. Oh, Pittsburgh. There you go. <laughs> just not my favorite video game adaptation on screen. I liked it. Obviously, it's better than the live action yeah. one, which is not saying much. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm going to put all of this stuff on the website as well. Um, Meltdown247.com. I literally, literally wrote, pulling this from Star Wars, hopefully this will be the spark that will light the fire that will burn down the notion that video games can't be adapted into blockbuster movies and ultimately make bank. Um, number seven, I think is super underrated. I wouldn't put it in my top five, but I think it's super underrated is Detective Pikachu. I thought uh, Detective Pikachu movie. was actually pretty good. Now, you're Ryan a, Reynolds, you're a thousand percent watching a little yellow fuzzy Deadpool uh, with a cleaner mouth. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, because I mean, not only is it just his voice, which obviously Deadpool is just his voice. Pikachu is just his voice, but he acts the exact same way and his mannerisms and everything. He just doesn't cuss. Um, you said the performance was electric. Mm. Yeah. For those that don't know, Pikachu is an electric type of, or a, yeah, I guess electric type Pokemon. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, there's a reason we haven't gotten a lot of live action stuff from what is by far and away the biggest media franchise and is not even remotely close compared to anything else in the world. This is literally the only live action thing we've ever gotten. There's, I think they did some live action thing in Japan recently that I tried to look up and couldn't find anything on. But there's a reason we haven't gotten it. But I think this did live action Pokemon as good as you could potentially do it. That I don't know is, if you agree. Oh, 100%. I wish this that movie came out when I was a kid because yeah. I went to see it as a 20-year-old and thought, wow, they made the Pokemon look real. I wish I was eight years old again. I yeah. took my parents to the Pokemon movie, or I guess technically they took me, and they were like, what is this the entire time? Because Which they one? had no idea. Um. Is there more than one? There's a lot. Uh, there's of a lot of. I, I'm assuming you're talking about a was there the one Mewtwo called the, one. Yeah. Was there one called the Pokemon movie? Yeah, that that'd believe? be a Pokemon the movie Mewtwo Strikes Back. Yeah. That's probably <laughs> it right there. That's the only the one I've seen in theaters. Was that one? <laughs> um, they questioned my entire existence, which is how I feel I would be if I went to an anime with. 
Tyler. But I feel like this is also a Pokemon movie. If you're like, Pokemon's nerdy, you can go see this movie and be like, eh, it actually, you know, kind of has a heartwarming story and it's got action and it's got all this stuff. Anyway, it was pretty good. And then number eight, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's was good. Not my thing. I've actually never played the games. I just know about them. It's a great game to watch on Twitch, but I feel like it's a terrible game to play. Um, but I would say it worked out well. It worked well for um, Blumhouse. It's a, the highest grossing Blumhouse movie. Um, easily the highest grossing movie that he's done. I know horror movies don't make bank necessarily, but um, just not really my thing, but I can respect it. And and I'll obviously go to the theater to support it. Also PG-13. Other ones, Mortal Kombat, I like the original movie. Uh, the, the original Resident Evil is the only one I've seen. Somebody mentioned you got to put Resident Evil in the chat. I like the first one okay, but I was not going to go all in on Resident Evil because I'm not a horror person. <clears throat> I like the original Tomb Raider okay. I actually like the first Angry Birds movie. I did not like the sequel, but I like the first Angry Birds movie. And believe it or not, I'm actually going to uh, give a compliment to Jake Gyllenhaal here. I actually like the Prince of Persia movie. It got wow. destroyed, but I actually kind of liked it. Wow. And Doom had one good scene. But maybe it was, it, maybe it's going to be a good week. Maybe this is going to be a good week for us, John. Who knows? Let's go ahead and get to Let number put one. That Assassin's Creed up there, boy. Something tells me this will be the last selection of the day. Let's take a look at what it may be. The Bob Hoskins Mario Brothers. John Leguizamo is Luigi. Probably something that Nick Offerman's not the president in. <clears throat> the Last of Us. The Last of Us. La- the Last of Us. Last I, had of us. A, I had a feeling you'd be going here, but I'm quite impressed this is, that this was actually your number one. Why? Because tonally, I thought there were some other things on this list that maybe you would have had more of a need to push rather um, than The Last of Us. Episode three of The Last of Us is the single greatest episode ever created, in my opinion, which Nick Offerman rightfully won uh, plenty of awards for. Um, ever of all TV is ever the best of all episode? TV, the best episode. The only one that comes close is episode Oof. seven of Westworld when Bernard finds out. Um, is everything a video game adaptation should be because... It's both a good blend of following the source material to a T and creating new newness to the world as well. Because the episode with Nick Offerman was not how it was done in the game. Yeah. But you watch the episode before that and it is shot for shot what was done in the game. It did a perfect job of blending all of that together. Um, Pedro Pascal winning plenty of awards for this as well, having to go up against Succession in a lot of them, but still winning some. Uh, won the SAG, won, won some over Succession people. Bella Ramsey was good. My only fear with this is come season two, it will not be number one on my list because of what happens. I know I have not played the second game, but I know what happens in the second game. And if they continue down the road, because I told my wife this, because I told her what happened in the second game, and she's like, I hate that. If they continue down the road of they've made – really good faithful adaptations of the game with adding newness to it. They can expand and make it better, but they got to do it right. And so I'm holding out faith that they can do it right because they did season one, right? But if they follow game two, it'll be hated and we will never get a season three. You have that guy who writes in no mention of uncharted or tomb Raider, both near perfect copies of the game. I said the first tomb Raider in my honorable mentions. Okay. It was mentioned there uncharted, honorably. never my thing. Did anybody here see the Uncharted movie? No. I have not seen it. No. Okay. Never I might nothing. go watch it. Well, I mean, by go watch it, I mean watch it at home because uh, I am a big fan of the Uncharted games. Okay. What kept you from seeing it during its theatrical run? Uh, at that time, I just really wasn't going to the movies. I didn't start going to the theater again until I got on the uh, A-List program, really. Okay. Well, awesome. I think that that's one great thing about A-List is how many people have – been re-energized to get back to the movies. Obviously, the theater-going experience is near and dear to my heart, and I want as many people going to movies as possible, and I'm glad to hear that Tyler is now seeing three a week every week. Not going to lose money. Tyler's I'm Tyler's one of the few they don't make money off of. I'm yeah. currently one a year. I have it in my quota. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. So, <laughs> See, that that was me, Rockstar, yeah. until I got A-list, and yeah. now I just neg- find a reason to go, but you have other responsibilities. You're going to have to negotiate Twisters into your contract, because that's a must. I feel like you got to go see Twisters. I'll see it. But. Long okay. as you pay for it. Let's get into the comment section here. <laughs> we have that guy who also says, uh, absolutely not the Mario Brothers movie from the 90s. Do you remember that movie at all, Rockstar? I was a huge Mario Brothers fan, and I'm going to tell you something. I did not, even watching the trailer as a kid, I was like, I have absolutely no interest in this. Uh, Bob Hoskins yeah. playing Mario? John Leguizamo. Like, I was like, this looks awful. Like, it looks nothing like the Mario Oof. I played. Dennis Hopper in that? Yep. Oh, like, yeah. King of the Bowser. Coopers. It, uh, King, King Koopa of the Koopas. Nope. Now, the perfect blend of that with... 
The Last of Us is Pedro Pascal's Mario Kart from uh, SNL, oh, well. where it's like a Grand Theft Auto thing. Because I feel like that is that movie, <laughs> yeah. what they're trying to do with that movie, but done in a quick, you know, funny SNL skit. That you know, hey, maybe there's a whole universe they could do from that. That guy says, "Halo, The Witcher, Last of Us, Arcane, and Resident Evil." Uh, wanting a Resident Evil push there. Look, I like the Resident Evil movie, the first one. First one's not bad. Okay. After that, take it or leave it. But that first one I liked a lot. Uh, and I was never super into The Witcher. I watched like half of the first season on Netflix. Just not okay. going to give any love to Max Payne. I saw Max Payne. <laughs> you, no. you're, you're that. You're John from Alabama. <laughs> uh, no, I saw it. That's Mark Wahlberg, right? Yeah, it was. Of course. Yeah. Um, no, it's not my thing. Max Payne. I, I, I only kind of halfway played the game. I rented it one time. It wasn't my thing. I love the Max Payne video game series. I loved Resident Evil 4. That was my favorite Resident Evil for sure, and they've remade that game 15 million times, but really enjoy it. And uh, Resident Evil 5 was okay, but those are really the two I sort of gravitate towards. Uh, let's see here. You have Nick. A mention of Uncharted as well. Or yes. Not Uncharted, Gran Turismo. See, uh, Gran Turismo to me is not about the game. It's about the competition that they did. Like, yeah, that exists because of the game, but... Like, I mean, I, I wrote it down. I just didn't mention it because it is more about, I don't know. I, I don't consider it a video game adaptation movie necessarily. Interesting. We have Steven who says Street Fighter, Halo, Fallout, Super Mario Brothers, and Mortal Kombat. The fact that Fallout's making so many lists this early goes to show you just how quality of a production it has been on Amazon dropping last Wednesday. Street Fighter, though. Oof. Wasn't uh, Fighter John was Claude bad. Van Damme in that? His guy was. Uh, in Bison? Was no, he Guile? And Bison was... He uh, played Guile. Was uh, Raul Julia. Was it actually Guile, though, that he played? I think it was. But... Uh, yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah, Raul, Raul Street Julia. Street Fighter was, was rough, 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 rough. But I'm glad you love it, Steven. Glad it's a uh, movie that you go back to, for sure. Kylie Minogue was Cammy. You notice no one's saying that the Mortal Kombat movie that most recently came out? I don't know. It's It was such a throwaway for me. Kano basically dropping no F-bombs desire. the entire the, time. Yeah. The one sentiment I saw online after that dropped was... Well, Annihilation's not the worst Mortal Kombat movie anymore. <laughs> I just I was and not I thought, a big fan. I was looking bad. forward to it. It looked really cool in the trailer. Just paper thin. I would recommend Mortal Kombat Legacy. Go look it up on YouTube. Really That's good solid. web series. Yeah. yeah. See, we have Benjamin who says Five Nights at Freddy's. Fallout is on another list here. Mario, Last of Us, Resident Evil. Three of these five we've gotten. No, four of these five we've gotten within the past year. Mario Fallout. Five Nights at Last Freddy's of and Last yeah. of Us. That goes to show you right now how hot of a street and Gran Turismo. video gaming is on. Uh, let's see. Brian says Mortal Kombat from 1995. That was an event movie. People may not want to remember it as being one, but that was like a huge event when that movie came out for sure. Uh, but yeah, I, you have a lot of talks about... Steven says Leah Schreiber's brother plays Master Chief. Yep, Pablo uh, Schreiber. And Porn stash. I didn't know that that was the relationship between those two guys, but... Yep. Leave Schreiber is a tremendous narrator. He does hard knocks and a whole bunch of other stuff. And anytime I hear his voice, it's great. I hated when he died in the Scream franchise at the beginning of Scream 3. The way they killed him was awful. Just tech that would never exist in the real world. But that's a whole other argument. So there we have it. Lentz's List, number five, Warcraft. Number four, Fallout. Number three, Halo. Number two, Arcane. Number one, The Last of Us. We'll have to see what else we'll get on this list at some point, because I promise you, Hollywood has seen the success that these video game adaptations have had, and they only want to keep producing more for certain. We appreciate your support of this show. Once again, if you're here and you can give us that thumbs up, really does help the growth of the channel, John. Another thing that helps is by visiting our title sponsor. That's MyBookie. Go to MyBookie.ag. Use promo code next round. Uh, basketball playoffs about to start. Hockey playoffs about to start. Uh, final week of the regular season this week. Major League Baseball underway fully. Go to MyBookie.ag. You can play in the live casino, play the slots, play anything you want to there. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere. Use promo code next round at MyBookie.ag. Indeed. We appreciate everybody being here. Once again, some big drops today, including a retro trailer reaction as we review kindergarten cop from 1990 starring arnold schwarzenegger also have that fallout season one review that's going to drop later today it is going to be a lot of content for your listening enjoyment we appreciate all of your support right here of the meltdown make sure you stop by culver's of birmingham or culver's of hoover and tell them that the meltdown sent you they've got the best butter burger you'll ever have i promise you that right there at culver's for john for tyler for rockstar I'm Tim Melton signing off here for The Meltdown. We'll see you again tomorrow.